Good evening and welcome to the cover one instant analysis of the Buffalo Bills day two selections tonight. The Buffalo Bills have welcomed Florida guard Osiris Torrance and Tulane linebacker Dorian Williams. And you are here tonight with Greg Thompson and Anthony Prohaska to break it all down. Anthony, I know you were just on with the live show that we had going with, you know, Steve and Dave and, and all the other guys over there. How are we doing? Uh, tired mentally, emotionally, <laughs> physically, spiritually. Um, but really interested to see what the path of the field looks like for both players that were picked tonight. I think their timelines are both different. Um, the position groupings they join are a bit different, but it's an exciting conversation to have about who the Bills took tonight and where they project and yeah, w- where they fit on this team in 2023. And beyond. So I, I think this episode is going to be a fun one from a conversation standpoint and kind of potentially trying to put some pins in things to see right. what things look like as uh, yeah, we have our instant reaction and analysis and talk about what these players are and what their potential fit looks like with the Bills. So first, I have to apologize because both picks tonight are completely my fault. Uh, so seven hours ago, I posted <laughs> this and wished for it for my birthday. You did it. M- my birthday wish was I would like a large human and then a missile wearing a middle linebacker football jersey. Um, I I was frighteningly accurate. <laughs> and actually, yeah, like and, all jokes aside, correct. And um, it wasn't. Ex- I, I won't lie. A couple picks beforehand, when I thought it was going to be Osiris Torrance and Trenton Simpson, I was like, "Oh my god, I'm a genius! This is fantastic!" Right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> look what you did now. Look what you did. Look what I did. Look, I didn't realize like the breadth of my powers. I was. I was going to say of- now you have to operate very responsibly, <laughs> yes. knowing what impact you could have on the world. I, I wasn't aware of my birthday wish powers, so I will keep that in mind next year because. My, my my birthday always falls during the draft um mm-hmm. so I, I i won't be shocked but i will say I, I made the comment in our cover one staff that um the the second round pick it, it we'll do the first half of the show will be on torrents and then we'll do the second half on williams i don't want to go back and forth too much um the reaction the build up like i built my list of who i was looking for osiris torrents was exactly what i wanted yesterday where my mm-hmm. number one wish was hey Just give me the easy, obvious, unanimous, like, oh, hey, this is the best guy available. He's falling. Let's just take this easy, obvious guy. And when it was Osiris Torres, I was like, oh, well, this is great. That's the guy I've had him number one on my list for like 15 picks now. That That's great. This is super easy. And then we went back the other way on the third round pick where it was like, um... (laughs) <laughs> I mean, okay, that's not who I thought we were going to take, but okay, all right, all right, I'll get my head around it, okay, okay. Um, so it was just funny, like, they, they could only give me one. They could only, they could know, only right? give me one. You hit your quota. Super easy. Uh, you know, they, they they can make it up for me in other ways tomorrow. Um, but, yeah, it was just funny that I, I think, you know, we'll talk about both guys, but um, I think today was a day where I – there can be success stories in this season mm. where neither of these guys see the field. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't know that like it's there. Both of them could, we'll talk about both, but both of them are going to compete for snaps and have a chance to play for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, But there are successful paths here where these weren't like obvious plug and play guys that no matter what they have to come into play. And that's the burden of having a roster like we do now. That's a, that's a, a very good way to put it, like the burden of having like a yeah, talented but... roster. Um, and I think that's pretty uh, spot on for both these guys. Torrance, you know, yeah, like what does, I, I don't think if, if we're looking at the offensive line and there was one spot to upgrade, I think unanimously or almost universally, everybody would say, okay, like Spencer Brown, yeah. you know, I don't think Ryan Bates is, is an all pro or this irreplaceable stud, but he was fine. Like I think serviceable or at worst, but like above serviceable, good movement has that positional versatility. And now you take Osiris Torrance. And I think the immediate question for 2023 becomes, okay, what's your best starting five? Like, is it Torrance ahead of Bates? Is Bates the, the swing interior offensive lineman for both guard spots and center? Um, You know, kind of, I I can tell you with confidence, David Edwards didn't sign because he thinks he's not going to play. So he, that, that, like, that's... he came in saying that, hey, 
I don't care what the contract says. I'm competing because I want snaps. He started right. every single game, regular season and, and playoffs on a Super Bowl champion roster. Yep. And he's right now like interior O-lineman five, maybe six. Right. Depending on how you break it down. Like he's sitting there thinking exactly your point. Yeah. I can beat out uh, McGovern. I can beat him out or I can beat out Bates. Like I'm starting at one of these guard spots. And now yep. you bring in Torrance and Bates is the incumbent starter. Mm-hmm. So he's not sitting there thinking like, oh, well, I'm, I'm feeling threatened. And now you almost have a bit of an interesting log jam that I think becomes fun yep. for a training camp battle in terms yep. of figuring out what the best five looks like. And then similar conversation for Dorian Williams, a guy who's from, you know, we'll, we'll break it down in more in detail as we go forward, but his path to the field becomes very interesting as well, yep. because now you almost have this like log jam with he and Terrell Bernard, and then somewhat of a skill set timeline redundancy piece although there is difference amongst all the linebackers it it, both of these guys present interesting conversation and dialogue around what do their time development timelines look like what is their what's the big law um, you know big picture plan for them what their path to the field looks like and then also in the case of dorian williams potentially you know, maybe is this some sort of a small or large inkling in terms of a breadcrumb towards maybe some defensive schematic tweaks yeah. or changes? Um, so maybe that could be a big picture thing as well. Yeah, I, I'll I, I have thoughts on that, but I'll wait because I, I I do want to go into that. I do think I was doing that right now when I was speaking. I was like, oh no, I want to save that. Yeah, I wait we'll, for we'll, that. we'll save <laughs> that. We'll save that. Um, so first, I think you know, Pete here. I I want fans. To so P is asking for everybody listening. So if Torrance doesn't win a starting job, how long does it take for people to sour on that pick? <laughs> One like forty-five seconds, maybe maybe yeah, a minute and a half. Immediately. Um, I I wish people could have the perspective of, do you know how like celebrated Howie Roseman was for drafting Cam Jurgens and just stashing him for an mm-hmm. entire year where he didn't touch the field once, and it was because he was really smart that he planned ahead because yeah. they had an older center that they were going to have to replace and be ready for. And he's a genius. And now it's going to be, I know it already. Like, I, I don't actually think Pete's pretty sharp. I, I don't think Pete's he's saying this somewhat sarcastically. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's talking about real people who are going to say this, but oh, oh my God, I can't believe our second round pick didn't immediately get on the field. He didn't start. He sucks. <laughs> Whereas this could be a really valuable pick for 2024 if we decide we're ready to move on from Mitch Morris and both Ryan Bates and Connor McGovern can play center. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden you still have David Edwards. You still have Ike Bakker. You have, you know, Osiris Torrance. And now you still have a fully prepared interior offensive line who know the system, who know Josh Allen and are ready to rock last year. We saw what happened in the games where we lost interior linemen. We lost the dolphins game. Purely because we didn't have anyone else who could just stand there mm-hmm. and be functional in front of Josh Allen. Yeah. Well, now we're going to have two of Osiris Torrance, David Edwards, Connor McGovern, or Ryan Bates, two of them not starting. That's fantastic. This is a really, really good thing. Um, we'll talk about it a ton in the lead up to camp, but Osiris Torrance was brought in to compete to start. Mm-hmm. I actually think it worked out pretty perfect because he was a guy that I don't think people would have freaked out if we took him in the first round. Like, I think that no. there were plenty of people who had him. Uh, we were talking reactions. about him at dinner in Mobile on our yes, last night as absolutely. being a first round target for the Bills. Um, I think a lot of people had him in the 25 to 35 range. So mm-hmm. the fact that you know some people weren't sure, you know, is he like a perfect Aaron Cromer fit who likes a little more of the athletic mm-hmm. quick footwork? Um, things like that. But at 59, it's a slam dunk. The guy is a mauler and, and is able to move people. So I'm excited to see how that comes together. And that, you know, I, I've said most of the offseason here, there's two things I want. I want to give Josh Allen weapons and time. So adding more <laughs> offensive linemen and, a, you know, we talked last night all about Dalton Kincaid. I'm excited about this pick with Osiris Torrance. I, I think that you can't ask for more in the late second round than you know, upside for starting potential at an offensive line spot. Like I, I'm very, very happy with it. I almost don't care about what a team's roster looks like. I will never be upset at a team for investing on the offensive line with one of their first three picks in like any draft. Like I, you can invest in, you should probably invest in the trenches every single year, both sides of the ball. I will never be upset at having too much offensive line depth 
or too many cornerbacks. I will yeah. never be upset at either of those things. And yeah, to, to, to Pete's point there, I do think you will get people who will jump sure. on that. Like, Oh, we sure. couldn't beat out Bates. Like this sucks. This guy's a bust, blah, 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 blah. Especially sure. because of what we've seen from a, uh, pick miss perspective correct, uh, correct. in rounds two and three previously. Uh, the, the round one that, two the, has not been our highest, you know, value return on investment. It no. has. If he doesn't beat out Bates, it's immediately be like, great, another Cody Ford, another <laughs> one for Bean. <laughs> boom, boom, tss, like, and that's what people are going to jump on. Which again, I I do understand to a degree because they have had sure. misses uh, in round two and on day two as a whole. But I think the value is is good there with Torrance. Now the question, yeah, just becomes. What does 2023 look like yeah. and what does 2024 look like? What yeah. is a, a multitude of questions, right? Like, I think it starts with Mitch Morse. What is his career longevity look like? Not from a quality on field perspective, because he, he's still a very, very, very good center, very capable, yeah. but from a health and off the field perspective, yeah. like not to, I, I don't think I'm making it's, this it's, dramatic at all. He's one, con- he's potentially another concussion away from not being able to play football ever again, physically, or because he makes the choice or, so or not. beginning to, obviously he's been pretty open about it. He's been yes. open about his conversations with his wife, with his family. They know that there is a point where he can be putting long-term health and yeah. long-term quality of life at risk. Now, our best case scenario, I'm going to flip this back the other direction. Mm-hmm. Um, I've long held the stance that last year, the reason Terrell Bernard was picked, and we'll probably talk about it a little bit more when Dorian Williams comes up, mm-hmm. is because the plan at that point was to extend uh, Tremaine Edmonds and be ready to move on from Matt Milano if we needed mm-hmm. to. Well, instead, Matt Milano went up another level <laughs> into an all-pro player and Tremaine Edmonds priced himself out of our market. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, well, that's not what we thought was going to happen, but it did. So we'll deal with it. So I, I want to put that aside because we'll talk mm-hmm. about linebacker stuff later. But I bring up that scenario because that's what a pick like this does. Because now next year, it could still look, I don't want to say wasteful, but it could mm-hmm. still look like not like the best utilization of assets if maybe Mitch Morris has a flawlessly healthy season plays great and they say uh hey you just want to come back and play again because you're playing great and we'd love you to keep playing great and we'll just have these extra guards hanging out and if that does this will look probably like an inefficient use of resources Mm -hmm. if it doesn't and god forbid he has another concussion and we have to switch mid-season and put mcgovern or bates in at center and immediately insert torrents or have Torrance already beat out Bates and Bates simply step in because he's the backup interior guy because Morris mm-hmm. goes down. Or we do at some point see a degradation in quality of play from mm-hmm. Mitch Morris. And then we're simply ready to move on next next year. This will look like a brilliant, mm-hmm. well-planned investment ahead of time. And unfortunately, there's not a ton of in-between because you don't know how things are going to turn out. That's exactly right. Like how how those variables shake out determines what this Osiris torn spec ultimately looks like in the end, like in a vacuum, arguably the best guard in this draft, like depending on what you look for in, in a guard, like either Steve Avila or Osiris Torrance were um, either one or two or, or were flip flopping, depending on whose rankings you were looking at or what you were going with. I, I would and, say 70% probably had Torrance 30% had Avila. Yeah. Like from my guess. And, and some too, again, like it, t- and then teams, how they have them ranked, it's going to be dependent on like what you're looking for in your guards. Like both of those guys, Torrance and Avila are different players in terms of body type and athleticism and movement in terms of what they do and what they kind of lean towards schematically. But in a vacuum, I mean, the physicality that he presents and I do, I do have some questions about what it means for potentially the run game piece with how much of like a physical yeah. kind of people mover guy um, that he is, especially like versus the run, just what he's able to do in terms of latching on to guys and creating displacement in the run game um, versus, again, with his size and his body composition, you know, struggling at times against speed rushers or guys with counters on the interior. And what does that look like when paired with the rest of the offensive line, but in a vacuum, he's a really quality prospect and he adds an element and a dynamic that this bills offensive line did not currently have. The only question 
I guess people you can really answer is like, I think the, the allocation of resources perspective, which like you said, as we go forward and long term, we'll start to really find out. But if you're looking at the offensive line right now, I think would people have wanted a guard or would people have wanted a tackle? I think most people would have wanted a tackle. But then if you're talking about the value perspective, the tackles that were available at that point were probably not as good as what Osiris Torrance is. So granted, mm-hmm. the need for tackle was higher than the need for guard, but the player that you got at guard is better than the players you probably would have gotten there at the second round. I would have loved to see a tackle in round three, but that's a conversation for another time. <laughs> um like in a vacuum, if you're just looking at the player, like he's a good quality player. And the next question becomes path to the field, what it means for the position grouping and then schematic fit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not going to do this cause that it'll just depress you, but like from a run fit perspective, run game perspective, can you imagine like critical goal line spot where we need to punch it in and Damian Harris lines up and, and Reggie Gilliam's there and they run to the right side because it's Osiris Torrance and Dewan Jones. Like that would be. I mean, you just co- so you completely human. cave in it's the entire so right side. You just, like it's done. You just <laughs> collapse the entire right side. I don't know that I'd want to, you know, see them try to manage a stunt involving Aaron Donald or anything like that. But, um, you know, we, we'll cross that bridge another day. Um, so I'll burn it down. Um, I will, I want to share something, uh, because when we talk about body composition and what it was like to see Osiris Torrance, I can speak with very much firsthand, uh, experience because you and I sat there next to each other in mobile watching offensive linemen. And I had the good fortune to interview Mr. Torrance immediately after the second day of practices. And I'm going to share that, uh, about one minute interview now. Cyrus, hey, great job today. How you feel like day two went? I feel like day two went good. I had expected another day on top, another good day on top of itself, and I had good in my own individual drills and team drills, and I felt like we played good all together as a team. That's why I, I noticed on a couple of the plays on the team drills, you were able to have some nice combos with the the center, getting to the second level. How do you think your footwork was uh, going today? Uh, I feel like my footwork is better, it's much improved because I'm more used to like the scheme we'll be going over, and it's and just all about getting more repetition. And just that one day of repetition I had yesterday that my game. I a lot today and watching the film was I was able to get much better. I was going to say anything that you are focusing on from the film that you've seen uh, here the same way that you'll be translating into a new scheme in the NFL that you're looking for uh, to focus on in the game. Um, probably probably my hand placement and my feet work just making sure I'm staying square my hips on top of um, my defender and being able to refit my hands whenever I don't have good hand leverage just always keeping that hand battle going and never settling for our right position just trying to get the best position I can and staying in front of the guy best I can. Excellent thank you. So you can see from my camera angle, like I'm not a small human. Like he's so big. Like he's such a huge he, dude. When, when we were on the field, we were watching uh Eric and I were standing next to each other watching uh one-on-ones for offensive line. And I had <laughs> I had the perfect view. I was maybe probably like six or seven yards away, probably closer than I should have been, but I had this perfect view between um the Packers defensive line coach and whoever else was helping to run the drill. And I just had this beautiful view halfway through. And then halfway through Torrance finished his rep and came and stood right in front of me. And I could not see around him whatsoever. And then, but Eric was next to me and I looked at his hands and I jabbed Eric and pointed. Cause you can see on his gloves that it says like four XL. Yes. He's, yes. Cause he was going to say that. Because he wears four extra large gloves. Because he's just a huge mountain. They're of the man. biggest hands I've like. I shook his hand, and like I don't, I don't have small hands. Like I, I, I have like a like above average size hands for like the size my mm. height and how big I am. Like it, like engulfed my little baby hand. <laughs> with They're massive. His, like four XL hands over yeah. top. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> Like I don't. I don't normally have that experience of someone dwarfing yeah. my hand in a handshake. It was huge. I, I literally just like I stopped watching the drill just to like. I, and I didn't. I don't even think I spoke. I just tapped Eric and I was like, I pointed and just faintly like, look at his hands. Like he's <laughs> he's a big, powerful dude, huge and that's reflect huge. that was reflected down there in Mobile. Um, it's reflected on the tape. Like you see him move, and and once he latches on to guys, you know it. It's a problem for uh defensive players and you know again you juxtapose that with you know will he be able to consistently you know mirror athletic rushers what does he look like from a foot quickness standpoint and athleticism in dealing again with counters and quickness and speed rushers but you've got somebody who is is just a big 
powerful, strong guard, like a physical, nasty, people mover type of guy, even though, you know, he's he's not, you know, a complete, you know, get that leverage, get low and drive. He's more of just really leaning into that size and ability to kind of almost envelop a, a, a defender and just move him with his body. So I think if you can get tweak up some of that coaching and get him with that leverage piece and add further technique and punch timing and hand technique and oh, yeah. footwork and a lot of things that he mentioned in that video talking to you, like it, it's, you're just starting with a very intriguing player from a tool size and frame perspective. So, and to Carl's question here. So for everyone listening, he has uh, now, if Bill's a line coach, Aaron Cromer is a guru, a coaching up lineman. Don't you think that any deficiencies of Sirens Torrance has uh, will be mitigated? Uh, obviously that's the hope. Um, I yeah. will say like, He's not the stereotypical Aaron Cromer fit. Cromer actually likes a lot of those like taller, lankier, athletic tackles that convert to guard. Um, mm-hmm. He's the one who'd like talk Tommy Doyle into switching to guard. Mm-hmm. Um, he so Torrance is not necessarily a Cromer archetype. I, I feel pretty strongly Torrance was. Bean saying, listen, this is by far the best guy on the board, and we can always use linemen. We're going to take him because he's by far our highest grade. He's not necessarily the, like, obvious guy that Cromer himself would say, oh, I want him. Now, to that point, maybe this would be a good fit where we have other guys who are more of a Cromer archetype that maybe Mm -hmm. it's good to have a little bit of that mix and match that maybe if he wins that right guard spot, maybe that's a good fit for Spencer Brown to have like a stout mauling mm-hmm. guy who isn't who he knows where he's going to be. And maybe that plays better mm-hmm. with some of Brown's mobility and athleticism mm-hmm. of what's there. And that some of that certainly would have nastiness together in, in their combination there. So, um, you know, I, I like Aaron Cromer. I, I stop short of, you know, some of the, you know, Dante Skarnecchia is a guru. Like he's yeah. like, those are the kind of guys where, Callahan. I don't care who you draft. Yeah, Bill, Bill Callahan. Those are the two where I don't care who you give them. They are going to make them better. Cromer is a very good offensive line coach. I think he's an above average offensive line coach. I don't think he's like making magic out of anything mm-hmm. that you give him. So I'm curious to see this when he's not a stereotypical fit of what Cromer normally looks for um, to, to be able to go that route. One thing Cromer does like though is – is hand power and hand usage and and not even to make Mm. the joke because of like the big hands, like he's got, um, what are you like? Like, uh, like vice grip hands. Like, Oh yeah. That type of, like once he latches on, once he gets those paws on you, it's a problem. It's just a matter of, you know, does he overextend himself too much and get too far out in front of his feet in the run or more importantly in the past, which is where this shows up more. Does his form and technique, you know, create too much of an improper balance from a leverage standpoint that makes him susceptible to a variety of things. So if you can nail down that form and posture standpoint, he he just needs to get his hands onto people yeah. because of how strong his grip is and how big his hands are. Like it, it it's a problem for defenders and it shows up regularly. And then also also using that hand technique to not let defenders get into his chest, which will happen from time to time. For sure. For sure. And I will say my my floor for Torrance in 2023 is we just upgraded the Bobby Hart spot because at a minimum, he is going to be able to come in in that six off- offensive lineman mauling jumbo set mentality and be an even better version of Bobby Hart to come in and just like, hey, stand next to Spencer Brown and maul the crap out of the guys in front of you because we're running right behind you. Um, mm. So that kind of spot – where last year that was Bobby Hart. And I, I came around to the point that I, I even say his name out loud now, um, where Bobby Hart was functional in that role. So at a minimum, we upgraded that in 2023. I'm open to the fact that I can absolutely see a path where Connor McGovern and Ryan Bates are still our two best guards. And that just the familiarity is Ryan Bates beats him out and O'Torrance is just an overqualified backup that we have a luxury of having there. Mm-hmm. And that he's more of a 2024 you know, investment for life after Mitch Morse. Mm. There's also a path and we've seen this before, Bef- you know, we saw it before they gave the keys to Ryan Bates, where he had so much value as that sixth offensive lineman who could play all five positions. Yes. That 
there's a chance that if they go and Torrance and Bates are, I won't say even, but close enough where like Torrance is right there and has it and is ready and they want to see that investment go and they like the idea of Bates playing that role. And honestly, Bates already got his money. He doesn't care. That's fair. Like, you know, and don't get me wrong, I don't know that $4 million a year is like the perfect usage of that, but it's actually not terrible yeah. for a super sub. You know, because I mean, we a, th- Bobby a, three, Hart- a three position super sub, correct? Like guard, guard, center. And I think we paid about we played Bobby Hart like 200 snaps last year, 250 snaps. It's not nothing, like it was a legit amount of usage. Um, so that kind of thing, I can see both those combinations happening. I think that there is a path at least by 2024 or without a like fantastic, perfectly healthy Mitch Moore season, or there's a chance he just straight up wins a spot this year. He legitimately could win the spot. I think that's what – it starts with schematic pieces for me because I thought he was better from a downhill perspective, like physicality, get down – like literally like downhill runs, those at-you type runs, the inside zone and duo and iso, like those type right. of runs. But with James Cook probably seeing the lion's share of snaps, I wonder what he looks like in more of a zone-based run scheme. Um, even though like Florida did run that, but at his size and not that he's unathletic, but he's like his, his strength is his strength and his grip. Like his strength is not like, Oh yeah, Spencer Brown, get him in space and let him just, he's not a dancing bear. That's not him. And I, I don't, I don't want to evoke the name Cody Ford because it's seen so negatively by bills fans, but he is more of a Cody Ford type lineman. If Ford had been, focus just on guard and had maybe even a little bit more power but he's mm. more of a cody ford from a footwork standpoint yeah he's not yeah he's not the most fleet of foot he's not dancing bears a really good way to put it i yeah, like that not. i don't think i've ever heard that before so that's very good i like that um the the question of scheme i think is a bit interesting um and i think that obviously that factors in for anything but seeing that type of battle with him and Bates, like i i don't I don't think it's out of the question at all that he beats out Bates for to be potentially like the starting right guard. Like, I think a lot of it is going to come down to the technique pieces. Like, what does he look like, you know, especially from a pass rush perspective, which is where I have more questions um, than I do. And with him in the run game, like, what does his footwork look like from a a cleanliness standpoint? How efficient and clean is his footwork? Um, And then questions for guys who are always coming out, but especially those who are, you know, more power guys and less less athletic guys. What is the, the, how precise are you in your punches? What does your timing look like with your punches? Um, That hand technique, that placement, stringing it all together with your footwork. And like I mentioned earlier, not getting too far out in front of your toes. Like, so how much does, does the technical and finely tuned pieces work for him instead of just being like a physical mauler type of dude who's winning because of size and grip consistently? Um, that's going to be the question of whether or not he can beat out Bates. And Bates is a different type. And that's also interesting too, right? Like he and Ryan Bates are much different types of guards. Like they are very, different players, very. which I also think is interesting in this conversation. Yeah. Um, like what do they want? Exactly. Like you are adding mu- a much different potential starter to your offense. Like McGovern is very much in the Ryan Bates mold. Oh, like a nice athletic dude, yeah. not a big people mover. Edwards too. Edwards too. They all fit that interior and also pairs better well pass with- blockers and run blockers. Yep. Not the most powerful, but pretty nimble and athletic. Check every Aaron Cormer box. And not only so that's that's McGovern, that's Edwards, that's Mitch Morse, that's Ryan Bates. And now you inject in Osiris Torrance. Like it's a different uh yeah, it's it, it's a deviation from what they've normally gone with on the interior, which makes me even more intrigued to see what the battle looks like and the long term plan going forward, um, combined with you know the schematic piece as well for what it means for the run game. So here, uh, Bills are electric. We appreciate your contribution very much. Uh, Bean needs an attaboy for improving the O-line, adding Connor McGovern, David Edwards, Osiris Torrance, resending Ike Bakker. I agree. I, you know, I, don't get me wrong. I think some people wanted like this huge splurge signing of, I don't even know who was out there this year. Well, they had all this money in free agency <laughs> for the salary cap. So. Um, so the fact that they did that without spending a crazy amount of money 
is they added the four name, the three names you had there, plus Brock back, brought back Ike Bakker at a veteran minimum standpoint, mm. um, is fantastic. Like that's excellent. And, and don't get me wrong, we've talked about tackle. I, I think that we could have seen additional um, signings there outside of just bringing back mm. David Questenberry along with Dawkins and Spencer Brown. But the team has spoken very highly of Spencer Brown. You know, I've had more trepidation. You've echoed that. Aaron and Eric have done mm. the same. Um, but the team obviously feels really excited about what's going yeah. on with with spencer brown so i guess we'll find out um but yeah bulls are electric for, appreciate you very much before we flip to the next one justin tyndall who, who's always with us here had a, a good question a while ago um do you think vets uh do you think bean mm. thinks uh, the vet dns are better than these prospects insert yes of course <laughs> um can we get a decent ro- decent rotational defensive tackle 137 and 205 I was really excited for Broderick Martin until somebody just traded up for him and it just messed yeah. up everything after that. I, I wouldn't, to be fair, I wouldn't have even considered him at 91, but Same. seeing him go at like 102 or whatever it was, I was like, oh man, that stinks. I really wanted Kobe Turner to fall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Into Both the, fourth. the two, uh, probably the two best non uh, combine invites of anybody mm-hmm. out there, the Kobe Martin and, and Broderick Martin. Very, and it's funny too that they're like, Kobe and uh, Kobe Turner and Martin are both like vastly different types of yeah. interior defenders. So it's yes. funny that like they like that being in the same kind of category totally. together. So to Justin's question, for anybody who isn't aware, right now the list of still available uh, veteran defensive ends: Yannick Ngakwe, Leonard Floyd, Justin Houston, Melvin Ingram, Robert Quinn, Frank Clark, Carlos Dunlap, Jadavian Clowney. Like there's still eight impactful football players who don't really want to go to mini camps and don't have any interest in signing early mm-hmm. and are just going to pick like, you know, championship caliber Super Bowl teams or if somebody's throwing around big money waiting to see who doesn't get a defensive end in the draft and are going to sign with teams. Mm-hmm. I absolutely, I mean this very sincerely, I think the Bills are going to sign one of those eight players. I'm not sure if I have a strong feeling which one. I think the Bills are absolutely one of the teams that one of those guys is going to go, well, I guess I'll go play for them. You know, maybe it's finally instead of Melvin Ingram harassing us, he now plays for us. Uh, Josh Allen's kryptonite. (laughs) Yeah, maybe Justin Houston can go her or Frank Clark. We can convince them to go harass the Chiefs instead of vice versa. But whoever it is, I do think that we're going to add one of those players as, as camp comes closer and as those guys' price tags come down and they say, yep, I want to play one more year. And I'll do it for those guys. I absolutely think that's going to take place. But good I, question from Justin. I don't see, yeah, them going into the. I, I personally believe Von Miller's going to miss time to start yeah. the year. I know yeah. some people. I'm glad that you acknowledge that because I said it once on Twitter, and the amount of people that came at me and were like, "No, he's going to be ready day one." I was like, "Oh, well." Oh. I mean, have you asked Von? No, I haven't asked him ever since the last time he told me his ACL was fine and he'd be back in two weeks. <laughs> so, one, I love Von Miller. I really enjoy him. He is an entertaining person. He's, I love his energy. I love everything about him. He honestly lives a lot of his life in the same way I do. In, I don't, I don't talk about the worst case scenario. I talk about the best case scenario. I, I do, and not like like some people take the manifesting thing a little far, but I speak mm. in those kind of positive affirmations. Yeah, like I talk about what's possible. I talk about what's optimistic. I talk about what I want to happen. Even if I know it's not necessarily the most likely thing. Mm. He's does that times 10. <laughs> like, the, like that dude is going to put things out there that are the best possible scenario. And, it, and it's worked for, he's probably it, done it the lead to this point. So phenomenal life, phenomenally successful. And to his credit, he did injure his ACL before, return in under nine months, play week one in an entire season, and had 14 and a half sacks that season. Yeah. Like fair. he's done it. Like he has literally already done this. So I won't put it past him. I'm going to put that into it would be a cool bonus bucket. I was going to say into the bucket. We're going to put that over here. Um, I am going to plan as though we will get Von Miller back like our trade deadline edition mm. um, and that we'll get him back week nine and that he'll miss the first eight games. Cause honestly, I don't care. I like, I need you down the stretch and in the playoffs, like yes. we'll, we'll be fine. I, you know, yes. we'll, we'll figure it out. I would love to add one of those veteran defensive ends 
one to have early on and then to be a pair with him because I would love Gregory Rousseau to kick inside and have mm. it be Melvin Ingram, Gregory Rousseau, Ed Oliver, and Von Miller going after defenses. That'd be great. Yeah. But yeah, I'm planning as though we need one of those guys. There's just too many. As of right now, even, even if Von was ready to go, you're looking at Von, Groot, AJ Epinesa, and Boogie Basham. And I just think there's still significant questions around Epinesa and even more around Boogie Basham. And then if you add in the fact of if Vaughn doesn't play right now, your edge grouping is Groot, Epinesa and Boogie Basham. And I do not think Boogie Basham is equipped to be an edge three in any type of defense, especially one that rotates as heavily as this, where the edge three is actually important. I don't even know if he's qualified to be the edge four at this point, based on what we've seen. I'm Um, open to him being moved tomorrow for a day three pick. I would move him for a bag of balls. Um, I, (laughs) I'm still angry that that was the pick like two, like two or three years ago. Um, but yeah, and I, I don't think there, I don't think they go into the season with the edges that are currently on this roster. There will be some sort of addition. And if you're looking for help in 2023, especially how the, the draft board has fallen and what you have right now, all of pretty much the guys you just named, they're going to give you a significantly much more known quantity in 2023 impact than any of the edges that are currently on the board right now. Now, if you're talking long-term viability, different conversation, but if you want impact and known quantity in 2023, you need to look to that free agency edge class. So any other thoughts on Osiris Torrance before we flip the page here? I think I, I, it was a, a player we've been talking about for a while, a consensus value People can argue like if he's a perfect fit, like you said, we're curious about the his style, his his fit in our scheme, mm-hmm. things like that. I think are fair questions, but it's a, a really good player, really good value, a guy that we would have been okay at pick twenty seven. Instead, we got him at fifty nine. It's kind of hard to nitpick that one. Yes, I, I one thing I do want to put. Uh, Aaron mentioned it in the chat, and I know some people had said it before, like uh, him giving up zero sacks this past year. I don't want that to be taken with well, this guy's amazing in pass protection. Like, do not use that as your metric for... Roger Saffold gave up zero sacks. There you go. Hey, but I mean, he made the Pro Bowl. He was a Pro Bowl guard. <laughs> so what we're saying is we drafted the next... I'll say Pro Bowl guard. You know what's... I was going you know to wor- say the other sentence, and I'm not even going to say You know what's wrong. worrisome from a movement perspective in it's my head is what the comp was. And then it's I was like, but you know what, though? That's okay because young Roger Saffold Correct. was fantastic. Correct. Correct. Like, so that's awesome. There like, was that's a time where Roger Saffold was legitimately an all-pro guard. Like, yes, he had a legit earned all-pro season. Yes, and was a mauler who whipped dudes' asses. Like, yeah, that was real. He just, we unfortunately got him the the old Belichick line. We we got him a year too late instead of a year yeah. too early. Was literally like, thing. dude, it is was never the most fleet of foot, and then he's older with a ton of miles yeah. on the uh, yeah. on the tires. But yeah, I, I think don't don't let the the raw stats kind of dissuade or push you in a certain direction and i don't even say that for torrents i say that for like anyone um using certain metrics can be kind of misleading but and i think to rj's point here that's like our uh a comp to young roger saffold is is a legit compliment that is a compliment i would take young roger saffold right now as a starter in this offense for a multitude of years like give me that that's sustainability that's consistency that's a good floor mixed with um a decently high enough ceiling like i would take that um, but yeah, it's again, there's, there's no real downside again, unless you have some huge hole, it's never bad to invest on the trenches, especially when you have a, a legitimate franchise quarterback and you want to keep him clean and make things easy for him. We'll just see, you know, what he looks like from an athleticism standpoint and pass protection standpoint, um, mixed with some technicality and how he holds up. But it's, just, this is a really fun training camp competition as of right now to see him versus Bates and how this old line shakes out. And a, a rare one for bills fans where, we're used to like lesser of evil camp battles. We're like, oh my God, I can't believe one of these guys has to start. Oh, and point. we're going to have one coming into this year. We're like, oh my God, I can't, I don't know who's going to start out of this group. It's great. Like we're going to have two pretty legitimately good starting caliber guards, not starting like we're going to. And yeah. of course that means, you know, Brandon Bean's going to trade one of them the day before cut down day for a future fifth round pick or fourth round pick. We're for sure going to trade someone, but we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Very fair. Um, okay. So as we switch gears here, um, you know, I think that I want to be fair and consistent because I don't want to just be 
you know, a, a homer about everything. I don't want to do this one. <laughs> I, I didn't love the third round pick. This is the second year in a row that I didn't love that we took an undersized linebacker who's probably best suited for being like a legit impactful special teams player. Like he might be a, a damn good special teams player. Uh-huh. And which is, which is cool. Yeah, correct. Correct. Not in the third round, though. Correct. Not in the third round. Um, so we're gonna go through a couple things here with Dorian Williams. Um, but you know, I'm not gonna blow smoke here. I, I wasn't ecstatic about this. Um, so we'll go through a couple different pieces. I know some people really like Dorian Williams. Um, yeah, his YouTube highlights are immaculate. <laughs> so Chris Trapasso was a big supporter of him. He graded it as an A, really liked him. Um I, I there are people that I respect who really like this pick, so I'm open to being wrong about this. And that mm-hmm. hey, there are people who put in a lot of work who really like this pick. I think that's cool. So I'm going to share a little bit. He is a linebacker from Tulane. He is six one, two hundred and twenty eight pounds, which is like strikingly similar <laughs> to Terrell Bernard. And when mm-hmm. we took him last year out of Baylor, mm-hmm. um, very similarly, he from a uh, super similar RES score. He's actually a little bit faster than Terrell Bernard. Um, but, you know, again, 6'1", 228, had a, ran a really strong 40 with explosive, like one of the best 10-yard splits, which I think shows mm-hmm. like his trigger of when he decides to go downhill. And, and Eric's talked about in some of his work that, you know, him like blitzing and, and shooting gaps and stuff like that, some of the best stuff that he does. Um, so that makes sense. I, I wasn't shocked. in in him being a high-end athlete checks out. Like he's got good arm length. Mm. You know, even so, even though he isn't the biggest guy, big hands, long arms, so it kind of helps a very little long bit arms with some of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, freakishly long for only six one. Um, so some some positive stuff there, I think, makes sense. I'm going to bring up a clip that um, Eric had and kind of let you uh, kind of narrate a little bit of this and on some of the things that are there, but uh, one that I'm sure will come up in in further breakdowns in the film room. Some of Eric's notes of what he had shared. Oh, you know, and this he, one, this one for I think this is for Houston. Nice. Um, so some uh, he comments here, some snaps uh, at edge. Uh, mm-hmm. Attacking style fits in, uh, as an add-on rusher or second mm-hmm. or rusher from the second level. Strafes efficiently with eyes on the quarterback and, and threats coming through zone. Easy mover. Gets depth in, in his zone drops and plays with very good zone awareness. Can carry a running back on wheel routes, closing speed. Surprisingly heavy hands on contact. Um, so those are the positives. Obviously, I think there's some things that we'll talk about uh, that is can this, come up here. Is this the clip where he crashes down from the edge and hits the running back in the hole? Um, there's actually a couple here. It's a it's a, a spliced together one. Okay. Yes. Yep. Yep. That's I knew it. <laughs> yep. There we go. Uh, so you know, a little bit in coverage. You know, using his hands there, uh, and then again closing on on scrambling, but you know, in in decent position. There, I think you see some of the issues when you're smaller, easy to get kind of so soaked up by a linebacker. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, pretty good job fighting through the the mud on that one. Decent movement here. I actually like this one, his reaction. So I'm actually going to pause that one. Um, yeah, this one, I think, does show, yeah, that like 10 yard split. Like mm-hmm. the fact, watch how far away he is when the quarterback breaks the pocket. Like he's all the way outside the tackle box and that boom closes mm-hmm. and hits him before he scores that one i was pretty impressed with and i think matches what we've seen there you know second effort sack there that that's not not too bad you know again you know does okay a smaller tight end standing up to a block but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the kind of guy that you can see here and you're this is not high competition in in what's going on here he's not a big dude <laughs> like he is not a large he is not a large human um, so let's, I'm going to give you a minute to talk about him individually, and then we can kind of talk a little bit about what mm-hmm. it means, where we think it's going to go. So first, you know, what were your initial thoughts when you heard the name Dorian Williams get, get pulled? So just him is in a vacuum as a player. He yep. was in that second tier of linebackers in this class, um, which is a class I didn't love as a whole. Um, but that top tier, depending on how you hadn't ranked it, I'm not ranking this order, but that top tier was Campbell and Drew Sanders and Trent Simpson. That second tier was your uh, Dayon Henley and Demario Overshown and Dorian Williams. Um, if you're looking at him just as a player, again, in a vacuum, very rangy, 
uh, fast. Yeah, I, I would say his his probably got plus speed. He ran a four four nine, and I think oh that is match that I like for Greg's birthday. That's fantastic. Aaron knows what's up. <laughs> yeah, Aaron. Good night. Good night, brother. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs> See you in a little bit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the the speed that he plays with, I think, is plus speed. I'm just trying to find my notes, and I was like, oh wait, I tweeted a bunch of stuff, so I'm just grabbing it. Uh, yeah, fluid athlete with range, speed, and burst who explodes into the tackle point. I do think he has plus speed. Again, he sure. granted he's only 228 pounds. He's he's built more like a bigger, thick, old school box safety than he is yes. kind of yes. a middle yes. linebacker. Like, uh, 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 oh god, he like honestly looks a little like Dante Whitner. Oh, <laughs> like, sure. yeah, like, like kind of like runs around like that kind of yeah. guy. Yeah, a little bit like plays with his hair on fire. The the plus speed is real. Um, so again, four four nine at two hundred twenty eight pounds. It's fun. You talked about the arm length, like ridiculous arm, like thirty three and three quarter inch yeah. arms. Which that's is, like offensive tackle arm length. Absolutely, like that's a that's a hundred percentile. Um, yeah. for linebackers, um, you see the physicality, you see the quick trigger, and how he moves. Um, and that fluidity shows up consistently versus the run. It shows up consistently versus the pass. He is a very easy case study in terms of movement. Um, and then in coverage, his awareness does need improvement. Um, though in coverage, he is very adept at mirroring tight ends and running backs. Um, he reads the quarterback's eyes in coverage. Um, I like what Eric pointed out, you know, the edge piece is an interesting one. And I think that, that this was kind of a calling card of that second tier of linebackers, both him, Henley and Demario Overshone were guys that on third downs or in some obvious pass rushing situations, they would line up at edge. Now, Dorian Williams doing that, this does not mean he's got pass rush moves and he's got pass rush plan and a repertoire. He's mainly just a speed to power guy, or he's trying to get around the arc or he's trying to run through somebody's chest. Now, some of the issues that I have with him from like a box play perspective, and we saw some of that in those clips, he will struggle at shedding blocks and getting off them early enough and or um, efficiently enough with his box play. And I think some of that is lacking the prototypical like size and some of the strength. He needs to become more efficient or more adept at slipping blocks, whether it's stacking and shedding or getting around them and avoiding them and kind of staying in front of the blocking scheme and not allowing defenders to get into his body and get into his chest. I think if you were frustrated because of watching offensive linemen get up to Tremaine Edmonds and get into his chest and Edmonds not being able to get off blocks, you will see some of that similarity in Dorian Williams um, with his game. But again, if you have the frame right or not the frame the, the the size combined with the speed and the traits it, it's he's a fun player in a vacuum I do think you know at this point we'll see what he looks like in camp but from what was asked of him at Tulane you know it'll be interesting to see what then this is part of the next conversation so I don't want to get in my head ahead of myself but what actually I'll just stick to that that's what he is in a vacuum you got a fast fluid rangy explosive type of linebacker who needs to work on his block shedding and block slipping within the box kind of processing and recognition pieces. And then some more of the professional coverage pieces, but he is athletic. He is a quick trigger. He's fast, kind of like a Banshee type player um, in that mold. Yeah. Uh, Chris key uh, here with an idea. I vote next year being trades as third round picks when he gets antsy uh, just to not have them and just avoid that opportunity. Um, so the Fair. funny part is, as there was that crazy run of running backs right before the Bills picked in the third round, I was honestly sitting there going, thank God. Like, just take them all off the board so he can't draft another third-round running back. Like, just remove the temptation for him to do that, and then instead he does this. Devin um, A-Chain, the running back to Miami, though, that's a tremendous pick, yeah. adding that speed to that lineup. And, ooh, I, ooh yeah. fun. Just another one? Yeah, because, um, of course. <laughs> so... I've thought through this a couple of times while we while you guys were on the live show. And as I was kind of trying to get my head around what I think this means, mm -hmm. um, one piece of it is it doesn't have to mean anything. It doesn't like, it doesn't have to mean, it doesn't have to be an indicator of anything. It could just be a guy that they had the highest grade on and they took him. Mm -hmm. Like they just could be that simple. Um, in the chat, I know a couple guys here asked, Oh, could he be the replacement for um, Saran Neal? And maybe. Maybe that's what he is. Maybe he's that special teams ace and, and going to be a gunner and going to be that kind of guy. I don't know. Um, 
I thought I, they meant like safety nickel corner hybrid. No, I was like, no, 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 no but no, special teams. No. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'm going to bring <laughs> this up again. Oh my God. I do appreciate Pat's on here watching. Oh my God. I hate Monty <laughs> Whitner just when you couldn't make me hate that pick more. You're welcome. Um, nice. so nice. I'm going to put something out there. Um, Eric and I have been yelled at it by other people a couple times for even considering this. Are we sure Matt Milano is not going to play a middle linebacker? Oh, yeah. Like, are we 100% sure? That's fair to ask. It, I just, that's the only thing I wonder is that, man, why do they keep picking outside linebackers and guys who would be better wills when we already have one of those? And why haven't we picked one? Is like, I don't know that it is. It is absolutely not only possible right now. It is most likely that our middle linebacker is a competition between Terrell Dodson, Balin Specter, and AJ Klein. Like I yeah. with like a maybe fourth and fifth of Terrell Bernard and uh and whoever the hell we just drafted. I forgot his name already. Dorian Williams. Um, I also oh, want to yeah, see yeah, a comment in the chat. Dorian Williams is not better at shedding blocks than Tremaine Edmonds. Mm -hmm. Like, let's stop. Come on. What are we yeah, doing? Come on. What, what, I, what, I'm I'm going to outlaw defending Tremaine Edmonds. We're, we're, we, we, it's we not have even a more to, to, def to defend Edmonds. Like, Dory Williams gonna, was in a second tier of linebackers for a linebacker draft class that was yeah. not good. Yeah. Sorry. Tremaine Edmonds was like some people's number three overall prospect in his draft class. Anyways, um, continue. So, let me continue. <laughs> Can I finish? <laughs> so, I again, okay, this this is a little galaxy brain, and it's really just me trying to talk myself into stuff. But copium. If if I'm going to cope with these last two third round picks, the one path where it makes a little bit more sense is we have Taylor Rapp, who is going to play. I'm going to say. 20% of snaps that we are now going to go from 0% dime to a slightly above average league average rate of dime. And we're going to run 15 mm. to 18% of dime and Taylor Rapp's going to be on the field. Obvious passing downs. Milano's going to be the only <laughs> linebacker and he's going to be on the field. I'm sorry. Then are you fucking kidding me? My, oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have, have you ever considered watching tape? Have you ever considered doing that? That would you should look into it sometime. You should you should oh consider watching film. I, I don't know if you've ever tried that before. Um, <laughs> third, so, third, third down dime package, I think, is a very real thing for Taylor Rapp or obvious passing situation. Correct. So uh, I'm going to put that off at, your train of thought. I wanted to put it, you no, no, it's okay. I'm going to put that at the top end. I honestly don't like AJ Klein's actually pretty good in obvious rundown, like yeah. goal line fourth and one like it needs to be real obvious <laughs> but yeah. when it's like real obvious like that's the hard part about platooning and eric gets mad about talking about platooning because how do you know in yes. today's nfl how do you know what they're going to do if you put the wrong guys on the field they're going to do the other thing it gives them the opportunity to dictate to you and put you correct, in a disadvantageous correct. matchup yeah so one they can't help it when it's third and eight or longer they don't get the choice. Like, you want to run on us on third and eight because we mm -hmm. put Taylor Rapp on the field? God bless you. Go ahead and run the ball. Um, so they can't help it on the top end. I think we're going to use that. Bottom end, I do think, I honestly, I don't even care if it's Bale Inspector or AJ Klein. Put one of the big guys in there. They can do the short yardage stuff in the goal line. Hmm. There is a piece of me that wonders, is it the craziest thing in the world? You know, you guys have gone through and shown Matt Milano can play middle linebacker in our defense. Mm -hmm. He absolutely is capable of doing that. Is it the lesser of evils mm. to have Matt Milano in that spot, which is, you know, honestly, maybe it's 90% of how good he could be in his normal will linebacker spot, mm. but having him there and then getting all of a sudden, we're much less anxious about, Oh, can a competition of whoever's best out of Terrell Bernard and Dorian Williams at weak side linebacker? Honestly, if I if you had to choose, would you rather start Terrell Dodson versus Balin Specter at middle linebacker, or would you rather start the winner of Terrell Bernard and Dorian Williams at weak side linebacker? I, I think that's a 
fair debate. That's a fun have. Yeah, yeah, that's a very fair debate. I don't know that there's an obvious answer. And you can tell me that Matt Milano is just too good at his weak side linebacker spot and you just don't mess with a good thing mm-hmm. and don't rock that boat. And that is the smarter, more likely outcome. Mm-hmm. But it just makes me wonder a little bit. Is that crazy? Like, I, I don't know. It just. No, I think that that's the. I think that's one of the conversations that is fair to have and it's on the table because you are looking at, okay, even so now we, we talked about Dorian Williams from like in a vacuum, this is who he is as a player. Now you talk about the scheme fit piece and um, how he fits into the specific team he goes to, which in this instance is the bills. Now you've got him at a spot that has so, a, a decent amount of positional redundancy yeah. at the linebacker position spot. And if we don't think Terrell Bernard is a middle linebacker, Dorian Williams is even less of a middle linebacker. Yeah, and and I guess Bean came out now after the pick was made and said he, you know, Williams is an outside linebacker because um, Milano's middle linebacker. There you go, which could be like I know some people were like, "Wait, are we switching to a 4-3 yada yada?" No, like God, no, no, no. It's, we, we'd be a dime before we're a 4-3. That's fair. Thick dime, bring it on. Um it 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 just becomes interesting with you, there's the second year in a row you have a third round linebacker who doesn't necessarily have a a a, a round peg and a round hole to necessarily fit into, and now you've got two of them kind of competing with one another. Which also, from another point, that's not schematic. Does that mean one of them is kind of a waste of a pick? Like if Williams beats out Bernard or Bernard beats out Williams, like cool, good for them. But then also, did we waste the third another third round pick type of thing? Conversation for another time, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's a fair question to have. Like, does Milano, is it a better combination of Klein and Milano versus, you know, Milano and Milano at Mike, like Klein at the mic and Milano at the will versus Milano at the mic and Dorian yeah. Williams or Milano and Bernard, however you're looking at it. And then how does that factor in? I was talking about on the live show earlier before the Williams pick. My thought, even though I, I don't like the platooning aspect, my thought started to go towards. I think AJ Klein is going to be the starter on rundowns and then third downs are obvious passing downs. It's going to be Taylor Rapp and it's going to be Matt Milano. Like that was my thought and shout out to Chris Kepner from cover one who anytime Taylor Rapp goes in coined the phrase, the Raptor package um, spelled with two P's, which I think is absolutely brilliant. Like I also think again from like a off the field storyline, maybe connecting dots point of point of view, I mean, maybe he didn't have a lot of options, but did Taylor Rapp really come here just to be like the third safety and not really see the field for anything? Like, I think he will be used in some way, shape, or form. I've I've, I've said it. I said it on our other show the other night. Taylor Rapp did not sign here to purely be a backup. I will bet any amount of money on it. They pitched him on a package yes. where he's going to be on the field. Plus, hey, we have two older safeties. Yep, it's likely you might get to play. Term. But even if they're healthy, you will see the field. Yes, and I think that's fair. And I also think it's a possibility that he's the backup nickel, which uh, could be needed. Yeah, yeah, scared of we back did, there, John. Because we didn't have one for no. most of last season. And I refuse to let Saran Neal occupy uh, that. Oh, that's an awesome comment. It's, it's so fantastic. <laughs> it's like legitimately like little rascals, like going to the bank yeah. for a loan. Put a trench coat over him. So, uh, so he fit, Walter S. has a great solution here. I'm disappointing you both, Greg and Ann. Obviously, the Bills plan to stack Bernard on William's shoulders and put them in one jersey to create the perfect blend of instinct and athleticism in middle linebacker. It's actually pretty fantastic. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and, and so, so one piece is like who plays at what linebacker spot and in what yeah. capacity. I think the second piece of it is, and this isn't a, a knock on, on Dorian Williams. This isn't a knock on Terrell Bernard. You don't, you now don't have a linebacker, depending on what happens going forward for the rest of this draft, but there isn't anybody, um, or free agency, I, I suppose. Um, so real quick, I know that comments already come up here. You know, right now in free agency, you're talking about a Deion Jones, a Zach mm-hmm. Cunningham, a Miles Jack, like a you're probably talking about like, Hey, this is a scratch and dent sale, there's a reason they're still a free mm-hmm. agent, That's but you at mind. least get you at least get starting experience. So, Mm -hmm. and all those guys who haven't signed yet, the reason they were waiting was to see a team like Buffalo be like, Hey, who doesn't land like a a top end middle linebacker? Hey, you guys looking for a contract? I'll come sign with you. I do think that some of those agents are going to be calling the bills and there'll be more $1.77 million contracts. Be like, you want to know what? 
come and compete too. I, I will, I will kind of be surprised if there isn't a mid range veteran competitor right. added to the mix. They, they, and, and that's a fair point because they don't have, as it stands right now, like they don't have somebody who can mitigate the loss of Tremaine Edmonds from a schematic usage perspective in terms of what he was asked to do. So that's the other interesting point or thought for me with the Dorian Williams pick, because whether it's Williams or whether Bernard or whoever, again, or if it is Dorian Williams, not only what does that mean for Terrell Bernard, but some of the, you know, Eric showed it in that video and I have it in my notes. He was used as an edge rusher at times and given his size and his ability to come forward and speed and burst, are we looking at, you know, potentially a little breadcrumb or an inkling of more disguised fronts, more different looks from a, uh Oh, who's blitzing. Is this a simulated pressure? Are they going to drop out and only rush three? Who's going where? Who's doing what? He's more like Micah Parsons than Tremaine Edmonds. (laughs) Your face is so fantastic. (laughs) Goodbye. <laughs> and I'm out. This, this was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> God damn it. Uh, well, well done. That completely got me off. That was very good. That was very good. Um, yeah. Like what does, what does him being picked and put into this team? Does that signal something schematically for the defense as a whole? Not just so one for that linebacker position or the linebacker positions, quote unquote, because does it also signal a move for Milano or if it doesn't, and he, you know, he, is he really going to be the outside linebacker? Are they lying? And someone's going to be a middle linebacker. That role has to change because neither Milano nor any of the other linebackers currently on the roster can do what Tremaine Edmonds did, which isn't a knock against them. Tremaine Edmonds was a unicorn, but what Edmonds was able to do, even if it was not sexy and it was just as a deterrent, what he was able to do allowed them to play a lot of the coverages mixed with the fronts that they played. So if you don't have that, that's not necessarily the end of the world. It just means you have to alter what you do from a coverage perspective and your roles and recite roles and assignments schematically. So that's my other thought too. Like maybe they're looking to change things. Maybe we're not going to see that linebacker carry slot receivers and tight ends. Maybe yeah. it's a different type of role. Thomas here. Uh, this is the first time in the McDermott era that I'm oh, confused about the scheme. Is this a clear sign of a philosophy change? Um, I don't think clear sign, but yeah, I'm going to stop anything. short. And I'm, I don't even think this is going to be a, we're not all of a sudden going to not be a base nickel defense. I, I would still bet a lot of money that we have four defense linemen, two linebackers, five DBs on the field, more than any other personnel. What I do think is going to happen is, we were the highest nickel team in the NFL, multiple games where we literally ran nickel 100% of the snaps. That's going to change. That is now going to shift. So when you say clear sign of philosophy change, eh, you know, what philosophy change to me is from Sean McDermott to Wink Martindale. Like that's a philosophy mm. change. That's mm. not what's happening here. We're still going to run more zone than man. We're still going to do a mm. lot of, you know, get home with four. We're not going to all of a sudden turn into the highest blitzing team in the NFL. Like that, those are philosophy changes. What I do think we're going to see is different um, scheme usage, different personnel usage and different things where I know, you know, obviously many fans are aware cover one has a a strong relationship with Jordan Boyer. Mm -hmm. Um, We know that one thing teams were doing against the bills last year is (laughs) We almost hurt ourselves. We became so good at disguising what the safeties were doing that teams stopped looking at it because they're like, well, we can't tell what the hell you're doing anyways. We're just going to key on Taron Johnson and figure out where he Mm. is and see if that can be our tell because you guys are too good at disguising coverages with the safeties. So we'll stop even trying. Mm. Now, when you bring in a Taylor Rapp, when you bring in other things like that, and now you can say, hey, maybe we can start dropping Taron Johnson into the deep third. Maybe we can drop him back into quarters. Maybe we can drop him back into a deep half. And he's not always the tell of where he is because we have an alternative to mess with that and to have into those short area coverage spots who can also be the linebacker when you need to be, who can also be that 11th overhang when you need him to be. Now all of a sudden we have a couple of those options. So mm. I do think those are, if you want to call that a philosophical mm-hmm. change that we have, again, I'm guessing 15 to 20% dime would be at the high end. Um, 
then yeah, that is a, a significant shift. We're not all of a sudden going to become a base dime defense. Yeah. We're not going to become a base four three. We're not going to bring in you know um, Dave Aranda's three three five and and stuff like three or three. Well, how, we already play a three three five because Von Miller's a linebacker. Um, I, hell, I've been asking for a three two six for a long time. Yes, um, so we'll, we'll see where those things go. I do think we'll see changes. I don't think it's going to be dramatic. Um, a couple other names I was trying to look up while we were talking here. Jalen Smith is a the kind of free agent linebacker oh. we're talking about. Rashawn Evans, Quan Alexander, you know, all like names that. that at one point were very exciting mm-hmm. names, probably aren't anymore. But honestly, you know, it, if any of those guys, if they sign one of Deion Jones, Jalen Smith, Rashawn Evans, Quan Alexander, Zach Cunningham, I'll be like, oh, okay, cool. Like I. Mm. There's a decent chance they're going to beat out Terrell Dodson or Bale Inspector or AJ Klein and be the starting guy next to Matt Milano. So I'm like, yeah, all right. It's already pretty obviously going to be our weakest link of the 11 yes. starters on defense. So any little bump in the floor of how weak that link is, yeah, is cool. I I think what what I'm starting to go towards now, I think we will see more of. Sean McDermott's Carolina defense in this Buffalo Bills defense. And because, because important thing, I think to to always remember too, like you can win with talent and you can win with scheme. I'm not a huge fan of the Dorian Williams pick right now. That doesn't mean he's a bad player. Like he has strengths. It's on the coaching staff to be able to coordinate and use those strengths and allow a player to play to their strengths while mitigating that player's weaknesses. You can do that with alignment, pre-snap you can do that with pre to post snap confusion you can do that mixed with the other skill sets that you have i think you will start to see for this bills defense i think you'll see start to see you know we've talked about just disguising coverage on the back end i think you'll start to see more disguised fronts i think you will start Mm. to see more who's rushing who's coming from where stuff yes this guy is lined up in the a gap and all of a sudden he's dropping to the flats. I think you'll start to see more run stunts and slants. I think you'll start to see more games. I think you'll start to see more confusion up front than just your standard. We're rushing four. Maybe we run a twist, but probably not. We're just rushing four. Here it goes. Maybe we mug an A gap, but we're probably going to drop out of it. You know, going through and, and watching the Carolina tape with Eric, like there. And, and even if you just, even if you don't study tape, like if you go back and you think what the Panthers defense was under Sean McDermott, like is Keekly blitzing? Is Thomas Davis blitzing? Like what is K1 short doing? Like what's Charles Johnson doing? Like before Greg Hardy was a horrible human being, like where is he rushing and what is he doing? Like what's Shaq Thompson doing? Like you had all these guys who were athletic and fast flowing and violent and versatile and McDermott pulled those levers and pushed those buttons and played to their strengths and confused offenses and at the very least played fast. And if you beat them, that was because you beat them. You either got somebody who won a one-on-one matchup or you identified pre-snap or were able to process post-snap and figure out the riddle that Sean McDermott was presenting to you. I think this defense would do they do themselves a, a proper service by leaning into that a bit more one i think it's just needed as the next step in the evolution of this defense as they've been not figured out but with what you mentioned you know with that poyer piece combined with what we're seeing on the tape they are starting to get solved a little bit i think this is they need that wrinkle they need that next step in the evolution maybe this movement or you know this the dorian williams pick or whoever they use at linebacker could be potentially you know a small little inkling or breadcrumb towards a philosophical shift in some level shape or form however you want to quantify it or qualify it like you mentioned but i do think we more we will see more um disguised uh fronts up front and that's a great comment yeah to get wrapped that cheap was great for the front office i always i also like the other comment that he gave saying um uh dorian williams looks like he can still add to his frame yeah with the long arms and at his weight he could potentially get a little bigger his lower half is definitely like that v shape like he definitely could bulk up his lower half he is overall like narrow he is overall like narrow narrow framed um i think he could do a little more to bulk on Well, obviously well, how does that affect his movement yeah, and fluidity yeah. and speed and all that, but that's a possibility too. That's just what, th- so th- those are the fun conversations you have. Like, Oh, what does this mean schematically? Or what does this mean for this? Like, and that's the direction you can take it or looking at him as a player in a vacuum. But I think there is, it is very fair for people to kind of look at it and be like, 
another developmental linebacker yeah. or yeah. the people who come through and are like, man, this guy could be a great special teamer. And it's like, you, you, you took that in the third round. Like, isn't that the kind of same piece from last year? And this is also another dude who, you know, was a team captain at Tulane. So you have yeah. another good, yeah. like culture guy, team thick guy, much like Terrell Bernard, like, and then you look at the production and it is, it is eye catching. There are just issues where he is, somewhat vulnerable and deficient right now. And it's just a matter of, can you either coach him up in those deficiencies or play to his strengths so much schematically or by design to the point that you mitigate those deficiencies or weaknesses? I, I will. So I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth real quick here. Um, so one, I've asked you know people before that like, oh my God, why do we keep picking these undersized linebackers? And honest to God, my question is, because sometimes they're Matt Milano. Yeah. Like do most you of the time, they're not. most of the time, they're not. that's which is accurate. Like that is not yeah. only fair, that's accurate. And my, you know, kind of snarky response was, do you get up from the blackjack table after you lose a hand? Like, mm. no, like you keep playing hands like, yeah, sometimes you're going to lose and that sometimes you're going to hit really nicely. And sometimes these undersized former safeties yeah. who have good movement skills, who went late in the fifth round. You know, Matt Milano wasn't some sure thing that we unearthed. Like we got kind of lucky and that, you know, his immediate post-draft analysis reaction probably wasn't glowing of like, what are we doing taking this former safety who thinks he can play linebacker and didn't test all that great. And what are we going to do with him? You want to know what? Cause sometimes those guys turn into Matt Milano yeah, and that's okay to take shots on. So, I said I was going to talk out of both sides of my mouth. Yeah, talk on um, the other side. <laughs> I was waiting for it. I was um, on the other side. Maybe hitting on Matt Milano was a curse, and now we think we can do it over and over again. Uh, <laughs> so we'll see. Sure. <laughs> like you know, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. And I think it's also impo- important too to to notice, like in in, the, in this particular instance, I think the 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 comment is like a thought provoking one, and I like yeah. it. But sure. using using the common denominator of like. Well, Matt Milano was smaller and this guy's smaller. Yeah. So like they could both I mean, work out. That's every every comp for the receiving class this year where it was okay that all of them were size anomalies because all of them are gonna be uh, I don't even know who the whoever <laughs> whoever actually survived and worked. Uh it, the Seattle guy. Why am I drawing? Oh, Tyler that? Lockett. They, they're all gonna be Tyler Lockett and all gonna work out. But man, yeah. most of them probably won't be TY Hilton. Yes, and that because when you just look at that one, especially for something is kind of wide ranging or broad casting, like, or uh, casting a wide net as like just overall size and be like, Oh, smaller. Like, I think that kind of overlooks all the other skill set pieces that exist. Like, okay, like a guy can be small, but what's his processing look like? What is his arm length? How does he shed blocks? What does his trigger look like? How does he do reading this and that? Like, how was he used? What is he comfortable with? Like, all of those pieces. It's not just overall like, well, this guy was small in a late round pick. This guy was small in a late round pick. So they could both work out. But what is their actual physiological makeup, their mental makeup? What are they actually like as a player from an evaluation standpoint and a projection standpoint? I would love it if if Dorian Williams, um, you know, turned into something big or Terrell Bernard or whoever, like Christian be Benford. Awesome. Yeah, it would be great. It's just to consistently try and bank on that and being like, well, it worked for this. Like it's the um uh it's like it's similar to the uh, arrested development yes. meme. Like, well, it didn't work of for course those it people. It never worked. They they delusionally talked yeah. themselves into it as though it's gonna work for them. But, man, but it just <laughs> might work for us. Um, so our last thing before we close here, we've already gone longer than we intended to go here. I want to take a look at just a little bit of what's left uh for this group going into day three. Um Obviously, uh, everyone was. Wait, 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 I shared the wrong one. Give me just a second. Falling apart. I really hope it's a tackle. Um, <laughs> as I, I'll, I'll, I'll fill the air here. Just start to find that there. I would like some sort of, not even just someone to beat out Spencer Brown. I just give me some depth there. Like I'm not holistically comfortable with Dawkins, Brown, Quest, and Barry. Um, sure. Doyle, like if he is staying there yet, wherever he's yeah, going, yeah. Competitor for that. Absolutely. Um, so he, just the consensus big board tool that I like to use that uh, RF Hassan puts together. You can see some of the picks that came up earlier that really did throw people for a loop. Um, of course, Marte Mapu went to the Patriots. Like that is hysterical. So spot on. And Keon um, White, like a, a, a traitsy, yeah, yoked course. up dude who hasn't had like the most production, of course. Like, yeah. yeah. 
you see, so, you know, Kobe Turner, the guy you were talking about, um, I, my guy, Broderick Martin, you could say two of the, uh, the, probably the biggest one so far until someone went third round kicker because oh, wow. God bless the 49ers Whoa, a kicker went for going third round kicker. Um, well, was the Niners because their roster is stacked everywhere else. Because so they, they can like, just throw just away, kicker. they can just light picks on fire and it doesn't really matter. Exactly. But oh, talk wow. to me Trey about Tucker went before, sorry. how in the world, like, Day day three, day That's three. The one. Keely Ringo, Dewan Jones, and people were going nuts about Adam Bawari that he was gonna like. There, matter of fact, I I talked last night. I gambled a fair amount on this. There were like odds out there to bet on Adam Bawari to be a first round pick. Yeah. Um, so some of the Luke Whipler, a super popular pick, Antonio Johnson, like just some guys who I didn't expect to still be on the board. Blake Freeland. Um, tackle there so uh, give me some names that you'd be excited about if we dabbled tomorrow if they made it to pick uh, 137 if we were able to to do a little something here um, I do like Luke Whipler. Um, he was one of my favorite prospects in this class. Um, really good movement center, built in the the Mitch Morse type of mold, like a technical guy, a guy on the smaller end, but good mobility. Um, played on that Ohio State offensive line. He's kind of like the forgotten guy with what Paris Johnson was and Dewan Jones was, but a, a guy who I like. Um, Super third- similar tackles in Blake Freeland and Dewan Jones, like very similar guys. <laughs> I, I hate you so much. Uh, Freeland, Freeland's tape for me, I watched him a little bit and didn't like it and didn't see the buzz and kind of stopped. Jawan Jones is a really interesting one. Um, and I kind of feel somewhat validated by how much he's fallen. Um, okay. especially with how many people tried to come Just at me a on Twitter. mountain of a human, but absolutely like, almost. So it's funny. I, I like the guys who do the, the, uh, ringer draft show. Um, mm-hmm. and they were talking like they went through his measurables and talked about, if he was two, in, if this was two inches shorter, he'd still be the 99th percentile. If this was 40 yeah. pounds lighter, he'd still be the 99th percentile. And I think it was Danny Kelly said, honest to God, I, I think he's too big. Like, I just think he's too big. And see, that that's the the, the part. Like, when, when it works, it's impressive as hell. You, you can't get around the arc on him. And in the run game, like we talked about earlier, we made the joke with like him and Osiris Torrance, like he can collapse an entire side of the line oh. all by himself. Or or if you let a man of that size get his hands on you, it's of over. course he's going to throw dudes out yes. of the club. Like he's a monster of a human. Six foot eight, 350 pounds. Like it's just, yeah. Terry's terrifying, but he's also got some technical pieces. Like he has a legit snatch and trap and he'll chop you right down to your wrist and bury you into the ground. He's extremely strong, very powerful. My worry with him is, and you saw this more, Early in last year, it happened a couple times um, against Notre Dame and Isaiah Foskey. It happened less as the year went on, but at his size and the lack of mobility that he has at certain times because of his size, which is both you know a gift and a curse, I think he's susceptible to inside moves. And I have a question of how, can he consistently anchor if you play guys against him in a wide alignment? If you put him on an island and make him work in space. It's hard for him to recover, which makes him susceptible to inside moves and can lead him to having a questionable anchor. And I think that is leading some people to kind of stay away from him a little bit. But he's he's worth a flyer in the fourth round. If he's there at 130 or 137 for the Bills, yeah. I'm okay taking Dewan Jones. Adebowari is another one who I like as well. His biggest problem, you know, he set the combine on fire with his his measurables. Um, I'm pretty sure if I, I remember that I said it earlier in the show. Dane Brugler reported that he's the only, you know, 280 pound plus guy to ever have a sub four, five, 40 yard dash in the entire yeah. history of the NFL combine, <clears throat> like just yeah. set the world on fire with his combine. The problem is where do you play him? You yeah. know, is he at his size, like 282 pounds? Like, is he a three tech? Is he an edge? You know, he played defensive end at Northwestern and he's got great burst and explosion, but he needs pass rush refinement. Is he going to get bullied off the ball if he's on the interior, but he doesn't have enough moves to consistently win on the outside. He's this weird type of tweener. But at this point I'm okay because I, I, I want defensive line reinforcements, especially on the interior. If you do think he is a three tech one, you have up there that I really want. Nick Saldaveri is my okay, um, so. I scrolled down specifically, it, just assuming that the consensus board, which has continued to be pretty accurate on the whole, because it, it is every year, w- the range that we're picking would be right here. These would be the kind of guys that would be available, um, would be in this range if we were able to get ourselves uh, someone in in this range. Saldivari, I, again, I, I don't know. Like, I, I kind of thought of him more as a guard. Do you think he's an NFL tackle? He. I think you can. I, th- I think he has the opportunity to compete there. 
Okay. Um, okay. I, I do think the idea of kicking him into guard makes sense, but I think it's 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 worth a very worthwhile shot um, to have him compete with Spencer Brown at right tackle, given how Carl he's able Brooks, to most. Jack Carl Brooks Roy, is, a, Brooks is another Chris type Smith. of tweener. Oh, my boy, Chris Smith. I will glad. I don't care. <laughs> Combine and measurables be damned. Ooh, ooh, I don't ooh, ooh. care. The tape is yeah. the tape. Um, yeah. He's an he's interesting good. faller. You can't play as well as he did at a school like Georgia in the SEC and not be good at football. You just can't. No. And I watched him, you know, from a measurable standpoint, I watched him run one-on-one with Jalen Hyatt downfield. And did, did Jalen Hyatt get past him? Yes. Was it by 10 steps? No. Like he yeah. kept pace, which impressed me a bit. Carl Brooks is an interesting name. Yeah. Super productive at Bowling Green, but another yeah, not tweener. terribly different than the Edibori comments you made. Yeah, yeah. fair. Um, but like where actually, where do you play him? He's got short arms. Like he's he, body wise, he's built more to be an interior defensive lineman. But with how he plays the run, he gets turned very easily. So he's built like hit. The way he plays is better for an edge, but his frame is better for a defensive tackle. So what do you do with him? Um, so he's another one. Isaiah McGuire, the edge from Missouri, mm. is another one I like. Um, just violent, compressed. He, he fits the Bills archetype as well. Compresses yeah. the pocket, can get into somebody's chest. He's a good spiker. Um, I would be very comfortable with him coming up on that next pick. I, like, Honestly, it, is it crazy to look at like a 202 so, who is a very different linebacker than Dorian Williams? I like him a lot. He's still on the underside piece as well, and sometimes his, he, he can be a bit too aggressive and his processing can mislead him. But coming from... He, he, he's not similar to Tremaine Edmonds from a size standpoint, but when you look at a responsibility standpoint with that match coverage defense that Alabama plays, he, 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 he can work there. Like this is a guy who is used to passing off and communicating and up oh, here we go. We're playing quarters or here we're playing this. I need to match. I'm picking up the number three receiver on the drag or the number two, or I'm carrying the tight end vertical. Um, and you know, he transferred from Tennessee, very smart, heady player at Bama. And for those who like want to throw things too, like he's the reason why Drew Sanders transferred to Arkansas because Drew Sanders couldn't beat out Henry Toto. And he's somebody who I've liked a lot as a fourth round linebacker option. Um, oh, and then uh, it's Sewell oh, just. So I was going to throw Sewell out there. And I know a weird one that is like crazy polarizing is Jeremy Banks. Like, I, mm. like a lot of lists, he's super low. And then there's like three or four people that love him. There's always like Banks is it's funny. Like you start to get like those polarizing guys. Like he's definitely in that mold. Um, Sewell is one. Sewell was supposed to be like a top 10 pick coming into like he was on like crazy way too early mock drafts. And all of a sudden people are like, yeah, maybe he can't play. I'm also sure. I, I also feel like he was like the number one linebacker recruit coming out of high school and like a top five overall prospect. Like he was really, and I don't know if that was name recognition because he's Cause uh, brother and yeah because he's Panay's brother um but he just he just has limitations in coverage with his size and frame like he's 6'1 246 he runs a six foot four you do see he's more of a downhill thumper which like he, he's kind of built in like the Jawan Bentley mold from the New okay. England Patriots okay. which isn't bad and you can have a role but in today's NFL super limited yes, super limited you're siloed with that spot yeah, like, Brandon spikes you're like that just that guy doesn't exist anymore in today's NFL it's yeah, super like, hard to you're trying to use him as an off-ball dude on on early downs but then maybe like you're blitzing him on third or maybe putting him on the edge or you're bringing him off the field and then you're kind of right. you know juggling plates um but the production is there and he's got the name recognition um and he's a guy who flashes a lot on tape which is yeah. why i think a lot of people he's a name that was you know recycled through a lot this offseason so i apologize for wasting everyone's time here because we're actually not going to pick tomorrow because we're going to trade that pick for deandre hopkins um so <laughs> i i've put it out there multiple times i felt pretty strongly i've said this for like a month now i thought deandre hopkins was going to get traded the saturday morning of day three Ooh. after teams realized they weren't going to get the premium pick receiver they thought and that they were going to put together a package for Arizona of, hey, here is a 2023 fifth round pick, which is better than nothing in the short term, and a conditional pick next year that can become a third if he hits these games played and he's still on the roster five days into the 2024 league year. And that way, hey, it's not like a one-year rental. If we do some of the, because you would have to restructure his deal, I can squeeze his deal down to like four point six million if they eat no money, and if they do a Brandon Cook style, um, 
eat like six million. Mm-hmm. I can squeeze them down to like three point five th- this year, and you're only kicking like two point four million into each of the coming years. It's not like yeah, some manageable. like like crippling move. You we we could pretty straightforward do it. The only reason we haven't is Arizona wants more than that. Well, obviously they didn't get a third round pick <laughs> for him. Like that that ship has sailed. They did not get a second round pick. They didn't get a third round pick. Now, notoriously historically cheap owner Michael Bidwell is going to have to decide do we want some short-term investment plus a draft pick for next year that's more that's as much or more than the Rams got for Jalen Ramsey that's more than the Texans got for Brandon Cooks that's more than the Panthers got for Stefan Gilmore this is not nothing that's what I've predicted this whole time and until noonish tomorrow i'm going to believe that that's still possible that the bills have had this offer on the table the whole, this type of offer i don't know if it's exactly what i proposed but something pretty mm-hmm. damn close to what i proposed has been on the table arizona had been holding the line saying no 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 we're going to get a second round pick we're going to get a third round pick well guess what they didn't so they are now faced with do they ride all the way into the season and have a disgruntled guy who doesn't want to be there mm. in a trash season that they know is going to go really, really poorly, where they already traded for future picks for next year with a quarterback who's going to be out with an ACL and has no incentive to come back and play <laughs> at any point. And I was waiting for you to just, just keep adding on all the, the other pile. things of why this season makes no sense for them to have a $20 million, 31 year old wide receiver. Yeah, not great. Or are they going to take the best offer? And, you know, I, I, the Chiefs are in this exact same conversation. They absolutely are. Um, they did draft a receiver. They took Rasheed Rice. Mm-hmm. Does that is that enough to tilt them away from this? Mm-hmm. You know, they took a second round pick. That's a, a legit mm-hmm. real investment. Second round pick receiver. Absolutely. Um, their second second round receiver correct. in a row with correct. this guy more last year. Correct. Um, so I I don't know. I don't know. I, I I'm just I until we get to that point i'm still going to hold to i think it's still possible i still think the bills are one of the leading candidates and i will believe he plays for the cardinals when i see it i don't think he's going to i think that's fair and i'm down to just go full glass cannon and bills are going to put up 50 points a game and who cares if they give up 25 to 30 they're going to play I aggressive defense with us. right we're going to play aggressive defense and try and go for sacks and turnovers and create negative plays, and we're going to put the onus on you to try and keep pace with our offense led by Josh Allen, Stephon Diggs, DeAndre Hopkins, Gabriel Davis, Dawson Knox, and Dalton Kincaid, and James Cook. Yep, good luck. Try to keep up. Um, And So Baltimore was also the other rumored team. They They drafted a receiver. Uh, The Giants were another rumored team. They drafted a wide receiver. Jalen Hyatt, right? Jalen Hyatt. Um, Just an awful lot of teams. That were in the running, all of a sudden, drafted guys on day two. Anytime you draft a day two player, that is a premium investment for that team. Except oh, so us, Dorian us Williams, and line, except us and linebackers, <laughs> except <laughs> other than other than us and linebackers. Everybody else, the pick really matters. Um, <laughs> um, so, anyways, you know, I, I'm, I, I'll continue to say the same thing. I don't think it's likely that the Bills trade for DeAndre Hopkins. It is one hundred percent still possible that the Bills trade for DeAndre Hopkins. Oh, that could all of a sudden turn the uh, the tide for everybody. Everybody would immediately forget about whatever they thought about Dorian Williams or Torrance or any doubts they had about anything. It would be DeAndre Hopkins. And if this draft Full class is Dalton Kincaid, Osiris Torrance, and DeAndre Hopkins, yeah, we're fine. Fifty points a game, whatever, yeah, whatever. Come get it Good until luck. we until. Till the AFC Championships in Buffalo, and it's like minus fifty <laughs> and seventy feet, mile an hour four feet of snow. And, exactly. Yeah. All right, all right. It's too late. I'm, exactly. I'm already punch drunk. And everybody's right, just going to be like, build a dome, and Dorian Williams. <laughs> That's what it's going to be. All right. So you, five hundred and thirty-two psychopaths who are still listening to us at twelve thirty-five p.m., awesome. please press the like button. We sat here. We did this work for you. We talked through all the different things that are there. Please press the like button for us. As PJ said, so you're saying there's a chance. Always a chance. <laughs> there's all non-zero chance. There's always a chance. That's my favorite one for you. I didn't want to say it. That's your tagline. Non-zero <laughs> chance. It, you know, it, it is. It, it really is. That's really legitimate, though. Like, I yeah. would not be – would I be shocked if the Bills traded for DeAndre Hopkins tomorrow? No. Do I think it's, like, the biggest possibility and, no. you know, guaranteed? No, but it, it legitimately could still happen. 
Yeah. Is it greater than 50%? No, it's not. But it is possible. It is absolutely possible. Okay. All right, guys. We appreciate the chat. It was awesome tonight. You guys were fantastic. Uh, really, really appreciate all of your time and effort. Uh, appreciate Chris Seth uh, with your producing behind the scenes, helping yes. us out. Um, all he double stuff. duty. He produced for the live draft oh, show too, awesome. so he's been rocking as long as I have. Huge well, and you. I was just going to say kudos to you. I'm pretty sure this is like five and a half or six straight hours of coverage for you. Yeah, um, five, and five, five so, hours, forty minutes. Yeah. So, you know, that is a marathon of work. Kudos to you, my friend. Enjoy, t- you know, dialing it back tomorrow and to just enjoying the draft uh, via Twitter and with just our thumbs. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but again, uh, Anthony and I will jump on sometime later tomorrow afternoon. We'll yep. see how our schedules go. It's a fluid, fluid situation. Um, right now, the Bills only have two picks, and I just predicted that they're going to trade one of them away. So, um, Maybe it is a instant analysis show on trading for Deanna Hopkins. Yeah. Uh, that one would be fun. Um, but we will be there for you tomorrow in some capacity to talk about what's going on uh, to be able to help things out. Make sure you check out the live shows that the guys did this week. They've done an awesome job. And tomorrow, I know that Kevin Massar, Mike Bunt, and a bunch of other guys are going to be helping out, uh, jumping on for live coverage during day three, starting right there at 12 o'clock. I think um, John DeRosa is going to be on there with him. Uh, a handful of other guys are going to be rotating. Joe in. is also going live at 10 a.m. Is, is well. it, okay i wasn't sure if he was jumping on with them or doing the tent so make sure you keep an eye out he may be doing the pre-show uh at 10 o'clock with his uh show under review so make sure you keep an eye keep an eye out for all those appreciate you guys very much thank you very much for all the birthday wishes you guys are very very kind i uh, appreciate that but on behalf of chris seth on behalf of anthony Prohaska, i am greg thompson you've been listening to our cover one instant analysis show and we 